Well, persecution is not a very popular topic among Christians today, and I think the biggest reason it is not a popular topic is because, quite frankly, uh, we uh, recoil from pain and suffering and persecution. In fact, if you don't think that is true, just elbow the woman next to you and say, hey, woman, uh, would you rather receive pain, suffering, and persecution this week, or would you like to receive an answer to prayer or a blessing from the Lord? And uh, I'm sure the person next to you would say, are you crazy? Uh, Of course I want to receive the latter, a blessing from the Lord. But even a less popular topic among Christians is martyrdom. And for this, don't ask the lady next to you, but just ask yourself. Self, would you like to be put to death this week because of your faith in Christ Jesus? And don't give yourself too long to answer that. But uh, these are hard topics, aren't they, that we need to think about. Suffering for Christ, persecution, and even martyrdom. And I know we as 21st century Christians, we do not think much of persecution and martyrdom. But ladies, the day may come that we may need to start thinking about that, as Susie just mentioned a while ago about the decision yesterday, or today I think it was, to start killing babies out of the womb. As we stand for what is right, we will suffer. I've talked to several women just this week alone who are receiving uh, suffering and persecution in their own church for standing up for what is right. But martyrdom and persecution and hatred was something that was not strange or foreign to the 11 disciples. In fact, tonight we're going to discover how each one of them was killed for their faith. And they not only had to think about it, but they endured it. And Christ forewarns them of this persecution and martyrdom in John 16, 1 to 4. So let's read these together. These things I've spoken unto you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues, yes. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think they're doing God a service. And these things will they do to you because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes you may remember that I told you. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Now, unfortunately, there's an unfortunate chapter division. Remember, the translators came in and added the chapters and the verses. And the reason I say this is an unfortunate chapter division is because where we left off last week, Jesus had already been talking to them about the fact that the world hated them because they hated him first. And so he's been talking about suffering and persecution for the sake of Christ. And so he's continuing on in chapter 16 regarding hatred and how will manifest itself in a shocking way to the 11 disciples. But I'm so thankful because as Christ gives this warning to the 11, and ladies, we need to heed this warning for ourselves tonight because it will happen if you're worth your salt. It will happen. Uh, All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so we can take comfort in the fact that we have the dear Holy Spirit. And remember, Jesus has just given them the comfort and the promise of the Holy Spirit. So as we go through suffering for Christ and persecution, and maybe some even here, my daughter always tells me, Mom, you're going to die on one of these trips. I just know somebody's going to kill you uh, because I've had a few women that have gotten angry and one that got physical and she goes, one of these trips, you're just going to die. And, uh, you know, maybe some of us will be martyred for our faith, but isn't it great to know that we also have that same Holy Spirit that was promised to the 11 is promised to us as well. Now, last time as we ended chapter 15, we learned there are three witnesses, Christ, the Spirit, and the disciples, and they all testify to the saving grace of the gospel. The method we saw, we have to go, we have to speak, and we have to show our works that we are genuine believers. And we saw last week the response will be hatred, persecution, But thankfully, Jesus said there will be some that will listen to the message and will receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, our outline for this evening is threefold. We're first of all going to see the Lord's mercy by warning of persecution. We'll see this in verses 1 and 4, the Lord's mercy. 
by warning them of persecution. Secondly, the world's method of persecution. The world's method of persecution. We'll see this in verse 2. And then lastly, the world's motive behind the persecution. The world's motive behind the persecution, verse 3. So the Lord's mercy, 1 and 4. World's method, verse 3. And the world's motive, verse, uh, I mean, world's method, verse 2. Motive, verse 3. So let's look at the mercy of the Lord by warning his disciples about the persecution. Look at verse 1. These things I've spoken unto you that you should not be made to stumble, or your translation might say offended. Now, you might be wondering, what are these things? What is Christ saying, these things? In fact, if you did your homework, you know that he said this six times in these four verses. That's quite a bit. So when he says, these things I have spoken unto you, he's talking about the opposition and the hatred that they are going to receive from the world. And he says, these things I have spoken unto you so that you would not stumble. Uh, the Greek word stumble or offended, your translation might say, means to do something which leads to the fall or ruin of someone. In fact, it's the figure uh, that is of a trap that has a crooked stick that holds the bait, and then the, it springs the trap when it is touched. And Christ is saying this. He says, I'm telling you these things now so when that they do happen, you won't be caught unaware. I've already warned you of this, that you're going to be hated and you're going to be persecuted from the world. Don't let this trip you up when it happens. As Peter says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial which is sent to test you as though some strange thing happened to you. Why do we as Christians think that persecution should be strange? We should be receiving it almost daily uh, if we are worth our salt. Jesus says, don't let these things cause you to apostatize. Uh, in fact, when Jesus sent the, the disciples out in Matthew 10, you know, he told them that they were going to be delivered up to the council. They were going to be scourged. That means they were going to be beaten, and they were going to be hated and persecuted, persecuted. And he also lovingly reminded him during that time when he sent them out and gave them their marching orders. He said, remember, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. And he tells them to take up their cross. Uh, if they want to follow after him, deny themselves take up their cross and follow him. If you want to lose your life, you're going to save it. If you want to save it, you're going to lose it. And then he goes on to say, for what does it profit you if you gain the world and lose your soul? There's no profit in that, right? And so he's very clear about what the cost is of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Ladies, the cost is this. It's losing your life for the sake of Christ and at times for some. It could be actual physical life that you might lose for the sake of the gospel. Now, by the way, before we go on, do you know this is the only, not the only thing that Jesus has warned them about in the upper room? If you have been with us since the beginning in September, we know Christ warned them of Judas's betrayal. He warned them of Peter's denial. Uh, he warned them that, remember, the prince of the world is coming, Satan is coming. He warned them, uh, we saw this in John 15, the seriousness of not abiding in the vine and how serious that would be, uh, and a lot of other things already. And ladies, I think it's a loving Savior that warns us of the dangers that we might be facing. He warns us as his children, and that shows his mercy. Now, that same mercy that Jesus showed to his disciples is also shown to us because, ladies, we are going to suffer for his name. As I said, as Paul says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But aren't you glad you've been forewarned about it? Uh, so, and if you haven't been, well, you're being forewarned tonight. So, and not by me, but by John 16, 1 to 4. Um, and yet, even with this warning, these things I've spoken unto you, that you will not be offended, even though Jesus is telling them that right now, do you know what? It will be less than 24 hours before they will be tripped up. Because the next day, you know what the scripture says according to Matthew? All the disciples forsake him and flee. They didn't, I don't know, they weren't listening, were they? It's not like some of our kids, they just don't listen. And they're going to be offended. They're offended and they forsake the Lord. Well, here in John 16, in the upper room, we do see the love and mercy of Jesus who loved them to the end. He knew they would be offended, and yet, you know what he didn't say? I don't know why I'm telling you guys this. I mean, really, I am wasting my breath right now. None of you are listening to me because do you know tomorrow... Every one of you are going to forsake me. In fact, Peter, remember I told you, you're going to deny me three times. He didn't say that, did he? 
He was very kind and very gracious and very long-suffering. So if you're taking notes, Christ's mercy is shown by warning them of impending persecution. Um, just recently, it seems like I have been encouraging not only myself, but encouraging several women that I know that are going through suffering and persecution uh, for their stand for Christ. And one of the verses that I find very comforting is, I know it may not sound comforting to you, but it's comforting to me, is, uh, woe to you if all men speak well of you. And so, ladies, you don't want everybody to tickle your ears and speak well of you, right? Uh, it's a good thing if all men do not speak well of you, and certainly if it's for the sake of Christ. Now, in verse 2, Christ is going to get a little more graphic about what form of persecution the disciples are going to endure. So here we see the world's method of persecution. First of all, he says they're going to put you out of the synagogue. Now, who are the they? Who are the they that are going to put them out of the synagogue? Well, the persecution that the disciples will incur will come from the Jews, the Jewish leaders, those, listen very carefully, who profess to be the people of God. Now, ladies, I've been a pastor's wife for 40, almost 44 years now, and I will have to tell you, most of the suffering and the persecution and the hatred that I have endured has come from God's people. Not so much the world, but from professing Christians. And Jesus says, they will put you out of the synagogue. That is the first method of persecution. Now, what does this mean, that will put you out of the synagogue? Well, it literally means they will make you out of synagogue men. <laughs> they are going to be separated. You're going to be excommunicated from the synagogue. In fact, turn over to John 9. John 9, I want you to see an example of this. John 9 uh, verses 20 through 22. This is the story of the man who was born blind. And remember his parents uh, asked, who did sin, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither did this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest. And then in verse 20, notice what it says. His parents answered them, we know uh, this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we don't know, or who's opened his eyes, we don't know. He's of age, ask him. He'll speak for himself. Now look, look at verse 22. These words spoke his parents. They feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already, if any man did confess he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue, excommunicated. Look at John 12. We have another example of this. John 12. John 12, verse 42. It says, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they didn't confess him. Why? Least they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Ladies, being put out of the synagogue for a Jew was a very serious thing, and there was three steps to it. Uh, the first step, when they were banned out of the synagogue, it was basically a verbal rebuke. They could still attend worship, but it was more like a verbal rebuke, and they might have some shunning, but more of a verbal rebuke. The second step of this banning from the synagogue, they could not go to the assembly to worship. And uh, this was usually accompanied by severe restrictions. Uh, they were banned from uh, certain rights and privileges. They had both civil and religious. In fact, they were considered as dead to the Jewish people. And the third one was a little more severe. It was actually a cutting off from the congregation. And remember to the disciples, this would be very, very serious because it would be like, um, actually not what we do today, but pretty similar because the, the Jewish synagogue was the place where their life really, their sustenance. Uh, they would go there not only to worship, but remember they would hear uh, preaching or the word being spoken. They didn't have a copy of their own Bible. And so they were dependent on listening to it being read. And so they would be banished from that. They would not be able to come in. They couldn't uh, do any sacrifices. And so they would lose all their benefits, not only religiously, socially, 
economically. Their friends would shun them. They would treat them as pagans. Many of them would lose their jobs. They would be exiled from their families, and they lost the privilege of an honorable burial. That's a lot, isn't it? So when Jesus says, you're going to be put out of the synagogue, that was a very hard thing for the disciples to hear. Persecution for them was going to come from the religious leaders. And what should their response be? Well, Jesus doesn't say here, but in another place, you know what he says in Luke? Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. In fact, in Luke, he says, leap for joy. Leap for joy. That's, a hard, that's hard, isn't it? Can you imagine if you were banned from the synagogue uh, that you could leap for joy about that? But ladies, that's what he tells the disciples. In fact, remember Peter is one of the 11 disciples, and he's listening to these words from Jesus at this time. And later on in 1 Peter, he picks up his pen, and that's when he says the verse I mentioned a while ago, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is sent to test you as though some strange thing happened to you, right? Rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. Why? For great is your reward in heaven. Peter had learned that part of the cross was suffering and fiery trials. Now, there's a second part of the persecution the disciples would endure, and this comes in the form of murder. Jesus says the time is coming that whoever kills you will think they're doing God a service. Now, how in the world could a Jewish leader think that killing the disciples would be doing God a service? Well, it's interesting here. The word for think in the Greek means to incorrectly think. Incorrectly think, which involves error. The Jews' thinking was absurd, and it involved error. But nonetheless, even though they were thinking incorrectly, they thought by killing the disciples, they would be doing God a service. And doing him a service meant that they thought it was an act of worship. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine yourself thinking that by killing somebody, you would actually be worshiping God? That's pretty bizarre, isn't it? Ladies, it shows how perverted the Jews worship had become. And you know, Paul did this. Remember Paul did this before he became a Christian? He felt this way. And he was a Jew, remember? And he felt this way before his conversion. In fact, when speaking to King Agrippa in Acts 26, listen to this. He said, indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He talks about shutting up the saints in prison. And he says, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them and blasphemed them. I mean, Paul thought this was, you know, a good thing to do. In fact, to the church at Galatia, he says, You've heard of my former manner of life, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure. Paul was responsible. Remember, he says he was a murderer. He killed Christians. Before salvation, Paul thought killing Christians as a Jew, good Jew, was doing service to God. Ladies, the Jews had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, as Paul says in Romans 10.2. Do you know the amazing thing is? This prophecy was fulfilled. Did you know that? Because most of these disciples were martyred. Listen to these. According to tradition, Matthew suffered martyrdom by being slain in the city of Ethiopia. Mark died at Alexandria after being dragged through the streets of the city. Luke was hung on an olive tree in the land of Greece. Peter was crucified at Rome with his head down. Would remember Jesus told him in John 21, when you were young, someone clothed you and took you where you wanted to go. But when you're old, someone's going to take you where you don't want to go. This he signified by what death he was going to die. In fact, history tells us that Peter's wife was also crucified. And I know she's not a disciple, but Peter's wife was also crucified. And that Peter stood by her when she was uh, being crucified saying, remember the Lord, remember the Lord. Uh, Remember the Lord. What a gracious husband to do that. Bartholomew was flayed alive. How would you like that? James was thrown down from a pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death. 
Andrew was bound to a cross where he preached to his persecutors until he died. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death. Thomas was martyred in India. And John, the writer of this book that we're studying, he was put in boiling oil. How would you like that? Boiling oil, and afterwards he was branded on the Isle of Patmos. I mean, that doesn't, none of those sound real exciting, right? In fact, the Apostle Paul, you know this, after various tortures and persecution, remember, he was beheaded uh, by Nero in Rome. And ladies, even as we move to second and third generation Christians, we find it no different. One church historian records this, the most horrible recorded instances of torture were usually inflicted either by the populace or in their presence or in the arena. We read of Christians bound in chains of red-hot iron while the stench of their half-consumed flesh rose in a suffocating cloud to heaven, of others who were torn to the very bone by shells or hooks of iron, of holy virgins given over to the lust of the gladiator or to the mercies of the pander, of 227 converts sent out one occasion to the mines, each with their tendons of one leg severed by a red hot iron and with an eye scooped from its socket, a fire so slow that the victims writhe for hours in their agonies, of bodies torn from limb to limb or sprinkled with burning lead, of mingled salt and vinegar poured over the flesh that was bleeding from the rack, of tortures prolonged and varied through entire days for the love of their divine master. For the cause they believed to be true, men and even weak girls endured these things without flinching when one word would have freed them from their sufferings, end of quote. Jesus says the time is coming that whoever kills you will think they're doing God service. Now, ladies, I think the thought of them dying for the sake of Christ and what Jesus is saying right now must have been frightening. I think it'd be frightening to me, you know, if, and if, I'm sure it was frightening for the 11, but you know, right now they could care less, right? They're in heaven and they're probably like, who cares about that? Um, heaven is so much better, more than this world of sin and sorrow. In fact, do you know that those who are martyred for Christ have a special mentioning? Look over at Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6 and verse uh, 9, if you would. Revelation 6, verse 9. It says, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, were completed. In fact, turn over to Revelation 24. It says this, I saw thrones, and, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the soul of those who have been beheaded for the witness to Jesus and the word of God who did not worship the beast or his image and did not receive the mark of their foreheads or on their hands. And so these here in Revelation 20 are those who have been beheaded for the word of God. Now, ladies, you might be asking, why in the world would people do such things other than the fact that they thought they were worshiping God? Why would the Jews kill the disciples and think that they were worshiping God? It's a good question. And our Lord answers that in verse 3, and here we see the world's motive, why they do this. Look at their motive behind the persecution, verse 3. These things will they do to you because they have not known me or the Father. This persecution will happen to you, and the motive is because they do not know the Father. But it's interesting, Jesus adds, or me. Now, if Jesus had just said they do this because they don't know the Father, that might be confusing to the disciples. Why? Because the Jews knew God, right? They said, we have one Father, right? God. But they rejected Jesus. Remember, he came to his own. His own did not receive them. They didn't see Jesus as God's son. 
But remember Jesus said, to see one is to see the other. To be ignorant of me, Jesus, is to be ignorant of the Father. In fact, Paul says in Romans 10, 2, I bear them witness they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They don't understand that Jesus is God's Son. In fact, when Jesus says these things will they do unto you because they do not know the Father or me, the word for know here means experientially. And we saw this back in John 14:7, uh, uh, when Jesus is talking to the disciples about having a personal, intimate relationship with him and knowing him experientially. But those who will put them out of the synagogue, those who will kill the disciples and other Christians, they don't know Jesus experientially. They might have a knowledge of God, but they don't know Christ. In other words, they would not do this. Ladies, this is also a huge reason that you're persecuted today. So it's a big reason. If you're suffering verbal persecution or any other type of persecution, it's because the world is ignorant. They do not know of God and his son, Jesus. Ladies, if the Jews had really known who Jesus was, they wouldn't have persecuted the early Christians the way they did, nor would they have crucified the Lord of glory. Well, Jesus now turns from the motive for why they would do such horrible things to once again the warning of what is to come. And here again, we see the Lord's mercy by warning of persecution. Notice what he says in verse 4. But these things I've told you that when the time comes, you might remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. The I here in verse 4 is emphatic in the Greek. Remember, remember this, men. I myself, your master, have told you these things. Um, Jesus wants them to be forewarned. He wants them to know. Uh, he's telling them ahead of time. And he does not allow his disciples to fall into trials without giving them sufficient warning. But ladies, as he gives this warning, he's going to give them the grace they need as they go through the suffering. And um, that's what a loving Lord does. In fact, they wouldn't be able to say, you know, why didn't the Lord tell us about this? He forgot to tell us that part of being his disciple. But he didn't. He told them. He lovingly warned them. Um, I thought of this even when uh, raising my own children and um, all the things that my husband and I uh, warned our children about. As they were growing up, especially in a minister's home, and after they came to faith in Christ, uh, we warned our children of, of fornication, sexual sinning. Uh, we warned them of marrying an unbeliever and what that would do to their marriage. We warned them about making sure they got the right friends and not get uh, hanging up with the wrong friends. Uh, we warned them about sin and the consequences of that. And uh, even the cost of being a disciple, we warn them of that. And uh, unfortunately, our children, I mean, not unfortunately, fortunately, when you think about what Scripture says, but they've had to learn the difficult, dif difficulty of standing alone uh, for their faith in Christ Jesus. But ladies, that's what a loving parent does. We prepare and warn our children. And uh, I'm thankful now that hopefully they appreciate that. Um, hopefully our kids will remember these. In fact, I was talking to my daughter today and she was telling me about one of the children and she says, Mom, I just keep warning her. I keep warning her of all the consequences of this. I said, well, just keep warning her. But, uh, you know, hopefully they will pass those same warnings on down to their own children. And it doesn't come from a heart of meanness. It comes from a heart of love. And uh, I've lived long enough to see the consequences of those who choose uh, sin over obeying the Lord. But here we see the Lord warning his disciples from a heart of love. You know, what's so wonderful about the Lord is his timing of when to say these things. It's perfect. Notice what he says. These things I did not say to you at the beginning. Why? Because I was with you. I didn't say these things to you at the beginning of the ministry. Can you imagine after Jesus had chosen, remember he spent all night in prayer and chose the 12 disciples. Can you imagine if Jesus on day one said to his disciples, guess what, guys? Uh, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be put out of the synagogue, and you're going to be killed. It's going to be so great. Come on, follow me. I mean, you know, uh, 
Jesus knew if he told them on day one about their job description, that would hinder the joy they would have for three and a half years together, right? As they'd been together and, and the, the joy of the fellowship and the miracles and the teaching that he had. There was not a need to tell them then, but now he's leaving. Remember, we already have discovered 10 more minutes is to finish the upper room and Judas is on his way with all the band of the Sanhedrins and he's on his way to portray or betray the Lord. And so he's departing soon and so he is telling him. And so ladies, we see the mercy of Christ in the timing of this painful process, prophecy, and we all can learn the importance of timing. Um, for example, you know, too bad Elizabeth and Grace aren't here, but... You know, Elizabeth and Grace both have new babies, and uh, neither one of them would tell Dinah or Lila, now, baby, don't marry a non-Christian. It's a rough life out there, and don't commit fornication, and don't do drugs. I mean, you know, Lila and Dinah would have, like, what are you talking about, Mom? They'd just be laughing and giggling, and uh, they wouldn't comprehend a word that Elizabeth or Grace said to them, right? It, they wouldn't understand it, and so Christ has the right timing and he's discerning and he's wise and uh, we would do well to think that as well with our own children but there's another reason Jesus didn't tell them at the beginning he says because I was with you while he was with them it would have been premature to speak about the persecutions they would encounter Jesus didn't give them this warning before because the world's persecution was not against them yet. Remember, as we looked at several of these earlier, it was Christ that was persecuted. The disciples had not encountered that yet. But he's going to be gone tomorrow. And they're going to have to stand alone without him. They're going to feel the hatred he felt. They're going to suffer the persecution he suffered. And they're going to die unjustly the same way he did. So we see the Lord's mercy by warning the 11 of persecution in verses 1 to 4. In verse 1, his mercy is manifested in warning them of persecution, not to be tripped up about it. In verse 4, his mercy is seen in encouraging them to remember he's warned them of this, and his warning was perfectly timed. Secondly, we see the world's method of persecution in verse 2. They're going to do two things. They're going to put them out of the synagogue, and they're going to kill them. And lastly, we see the world's motive behind the persecution in verse 3. The reason they do these things is because they don't know the Father, and they don't know Jesus. Now, ladies, I know this isn't a feel-good lesson. I mean, persecution and martyrdom are not pleasant topics but they are a reality. You might say, yeah, they're a reality to the disciples, Susan, but not to me. I mean, you know, I live in a comfortable home and I have a car and I, you know, I have to worry about persecution. But ladies, did you know the time might come where we will be persecuted? In fact, do you know in the 20th century alone, I know we're in the 21st century now, but in the 20th century alone, do you know there were over 100 million martyrs for Christ? 100 million. Do you know there have been more people martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ in the 20th century than in all the previous 19 centuries combined? So it's getting worse, not getting better. It's getting worse. More people have died in circumstances related to their faith in this century than in all the 20th century wars combined. In fact, I pulled this just recently from a website that is a, a one that talks about the current martyrs that are going on. It says Christians remain one of the most persecuted religious groups in the world. While Christian persecution takes many forms, it's defined as any hostility experienced as a result of identification with Christ. Christians throughout the world continue to risk imprisonment, loss of home, assets, torture, beheadings, rape, and even death as a result of their faith. Trends show that countries in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East are intensifying persecution against Christians, and perhaps the most vulnerable are Christian women who often face double persecution for their faith and gender. Every day, we receive new reports of Christians who face threats, unjust imprisonment, harassment, beating, 
and even loss of family because of their faith in Christ. Get this statistic. This is a current one. Every month, 255 Christians are killed. 104 are abducted. 180 Christian women are raped, sexually harassed, or forced into marriage. 66 churches are attacked. And 160 Christians are detained without trial and in prison. That's every month. Now, you know, we might be saying, is this ever going to end? Probably not. (laughs) Probably not. Ladies, it's not going to end. I think it's going to get worse. And I think it's going to get worse here in America. I really thought with our new president, we might see a slowing down of our, you know, of our Christian persecution. And we had a little more liberties. But with the recent things going on, I I don't think it is going to slow down. And it's not going to end until Jesus comes and takes us home to heaven. But I think the bigger question that we need to ask ourselves as we enter into this time in our world where there's this increasing hatred towards believers is why don't we see more hatred and more persecution and even martyrdom among Christians? Paul says, yes, and all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. I believe the answer to that question lies in this fact. We live in a Christianized nation, but ladies, we have failed to be salt and light. We look just like the world, you know? We look just like the world. But the day may come here in America, and I think sooner than we think, where either we or our children may be martyred for our faith. Are we ready? Are you preparing your kids? Could happen. Who are going to be the martyrs of the 21st century, and who will be their persecutors? Ladies, we must make up our mind that we will endure the battles, the opposition, the conflicts, the wounds, the persecution, and perhaps even death. J.C. Ryle once said this, We can never tell what is before us in life, but of one thing we may be very sure. We must carry the cross if we are going to wear the crown. Let's pray. Father, I know this lesson seems very foreign to many of us as we sit in our comfortable homes and we have so much. We have a church that holds forth the truth of your word. We have brothers and sisters in Christ that we get to fellowship with and enjoy. And yet, Lord, many of our brothers and sisters around the world are suffering even right now because of Christ Many are being beaten. Many of their homes are being taken. Many churches are being burned down. And we are here in America where we are somewhat um, protected from that. And yet we are seeing more and more verbal persecution and some physical. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be willing to take up our cross and follow you, that we would be willing to speak truth where truth is not being spoken that we would be willing to be light even in our own churches where many well-meaning Christians are not living out what they say they believe and we would not be afraid to speak up when we need to, even if it means we will incur suffering and persecution. And so, Father, I pray that you will help us, help us as a nation, help us as a people, help us as a church, help each family represented Lord, to prepare themselves for what might come and may be sooner than we think. We don't know what you have for us. But we do know, Lord, that this will all end when Christ comes back, and we would pray, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Mm-hmm.